a presentation this evening, we're going to be talking about what's the purpose and the role of, of zoning. I won't get, zoning's not the most exciting topic in the world, but uh, we'll give you an overview of, uh, of uh, the purpose and the role of, of zoning. Uh, we'll give an overview of the Route 6 corridor, uh, what it, where it is and you know, what our assessment is. Uh, we'll take a look at the current zoning and we'll be looking at a future vision uh, for the Route 6 corridor and due to its size it has been divided into sub-districts that we'll be talking about. Uh, we'll also start getting into some of the regulatory uh, provisions that are being contemplated uh, and design guidelines and we'll be looking at the types of buildings that uh, and development that we're, we're looking at as kind of a target and then we'll talk about the next steps, what's going to happen after, after tonight, um, and then we'll open it up for, for questions. Does that uh, sound good? Uh, I think for, for questions, unless you have a real pressing one during my presentation, we'll try to save that to the end, but if, uh, if somebody um, feels the need to ask a question during the uh, presentation, I'm more than happy to, uh, to accommodate. So, uh, the previous planning initiatives, uh, I'm going to turn so I can see the screen. My computer screen doesn't seem to want to follow what I'm getting on the... Okay, we did the purpose. Uh, as Jim had mentioned, uh, the, over the past 19, 20 years, there's been a number of planning studies that have been done on the, on the Route 6 corridor. Um, you can r read them all themselves, and, and they are uh, most of these studies. Michael, we have most of these studies online on the uh, planning board's uh, uh, website for the town's website. So if anybody's interested in doing a, a deeper dive, you can take a look um, at any of these studies. But they go from uh, as early as uh, 2005 uh, up, up until uh, um, there was discussion in the 2021 master plan update and the um, master dot in 2021 has also been looking at what the uh, roadway corridor improvements um, on Route 6 are as well. Uh, and in 2012, uh, the Science and Technology Overlay District uh, was a result of previous studies that uh, put together a, an overlay district, and we'll be getting into, into that. Uh, this slide um, is intended to show you what, what is in the study area. So the, uh, the areas that are shown in the um, non-green colors, uh, basically along Route 6, uh, all the way from the Fall River City Line, uh, down to the intersection with Route 177, uh, and then Route 177, the north side of Route 177, uh, up to Route 888, um, and then, uh, excuse me, uh, this portion um, is green, is also included, which coincides pretty closely with the uh, current Science and Technology Overlay District. Um, so that is the, the subject area, or the study area, if, if you would, just to give you an idea. Um, and the reason for this is the uh, Route 6, and, and most of these areas are primarily zoned um, uh, one of three zoning districts, uh, and predominantly they're zoned for uh, co commercial uh, development, uh, with the exception of, of one that's uh, zoned unrestricted, which we'll be talking about. Okay. Okay, we got, um, this is a, uh, the existing zoning, uh, which we just had. 
Okay. Uh, another si slide we wanted to show was the parcel size. Um, you can see from the legend over here that the current zoning for all zoning districts in Westport are 60,000 square feet. That's an acre and a half approximately. And the parcels that are 60,000 square feet are shown in, in this color. Um, this, I think, is an interesting plan because this is an area that was developed historically um, you know, early on in the, in the development of the town of Westport. And a lot of the properties um, do not comply. They are all uh, less than the 60,000 square feet. Some of them are as small as 10,000 square feet, some a uh, half acre. Uh, but it's, it's interesting because all, all of these properties uh, that do not have the, the pink shading uh, are considered um, non-conforming. It's, it's not that they're not legal, it's just that they were developed before the 60,000 square foot minimum lot size came into being. But that's something we're, we've been keeping an eye on. Uh, this slide shows the land use in the study area. Uh, the red indicates uh, commercially business type uses. Uh, the orange represents uh, residential type uses. The uh, purple represents uh, industrial manufacturing type of, of uses. And then we have uh, green areas that represent developable land. And we have some darker green that indicates undevelopable land, um, some of which is undevelopable by reason of the uh, presence of uh, natural resource areas, protected resource areas, wetlands, aquifer protection, uh, water bodies. Uh, and others are uh, considered uh, to be non-developable because they may not have uh, frontage, they're landlocked lots, um, which isn't to say that if they join with an, another lot that has frontage on a street, they may, uh, may become more developable. Um, this is just a, a breakdown of the existing uses in the, um, in the town. And you can see that uh, for the most part, uh, with the exception of the uh, unrestricted area, um, multifamily is the only place where uh, it's currently allowed. Um, mixed uses manufacturing are allowed there. Um, mixed uses manufacturing uh, is not allowed in the business residential districts. The town basically has th three what we call underlying zoning districts. The business district, the residential district, and the unrestricted district. Um, and that covers the whole town. There are also overlay districts, which are uh, zones that are superimposed over the, the underlying zoning. Uh, uh, there, there are several. The two most prominent would be the Science and Technology Overlay District, and there is a, an Adult Entertainment Overlay District uh, that exists along the north side of Route 6, um, right near the intersection of uh, Route 6 and uh, Highway uh, Route 88. Uh, this shows uh, what the dimensional requirements are for all of these zoning districts. Uh, and if you look at the three major zoning districts, uh, there's really not a lot of difference between them in terms of dimensional requirements. Uh, the only major difference is the unrestricted district does allow for um, multifamily, and this would be the uh, permitted density uh, per unit uh, uh, in that district. The uh, Delta Entertainment pretty much follows the same zoning requirements as the three major districts, and the Science and Technology Overlay District has a different, uh, differs from, from all of the other districts by virtue of larger 
it contemplated larger development, uh, greater setbacks, etc. Okay, one of the things we were tasked with in, in doing this study was, uh, can you give us kind of a, uh, uh, an analysis, uh, a, a breakdown of, uh, an audit of, uh, of the existing zoning and how that ties into uh, the future of the study area. And the current zoning, as I mentioned, uh, has only three districts. And uh, our feeling is that the one size fits all is not really appropriate. Um, should you, for example, in uh, the, the neighborhood, uh, uh, should the uh, town center village area business owned properties have the same requirements as as businesses along Route 6. Um, uh, you know, they're totally different flavors of, of areas. I think um, when you start looking at the requirements, you, you don't get this, it doesn't really trans, translate well into uh, the type of uh, um, setbacks, lot sizes, et cetera, that you really want to see are what the type of uses are. The current science and technology overlay district, while it was very carefully crafted, um, hasn't received a lot of attention uh, in its existence. It's been around for 10, 10 or so years, Jim. Um, so uh, there's been, I think, one or two developments that have taken advantage of it, but for the most part, it, it hasn't really resonated uh, with uh, much interest from the development or the business community. Um, the other thing that's kind of unique and uh, we, we think is a uh, impediment to uh, d development is the, the schedule of use table. Um, in the zoning, it's, it's that one part of the zoning that has all the Ys and the Ns and the SPs and, and all the uses on the left side. When, when you start looking at that, um, the types of uses, the table of use regulations gets really w overly specific in terms of certain uses. And for example, manufacturing of musical instruments as opposed to why not just manufacturing um, and, and the reason that becomes problematic is that the zoning is written in a way that says that unless your use is specifically identified in the use regulations, it's considered to be prohibited. Um, so you end up getting in a lot of questions when a use might be a good fit, but when they look at the table and say, well, jeepers, uh, oh, this is not the manufacturing of of electronic testing equipment, uh, so uh, your manufacturing isn't doing that. So, uh, uh, so that's a, a problem that we've we've noted. The other thing uh, that we noted, and I I know there uh, uh, there have been uh, a recent a attempt to put. Right now, you have no regulations governing signage in town. It's pretty much the wild west, and I know there was some. Uh, attempt a, a year or two ago at town meeting to adopt some type of regulations for, for signage and it, it, it was not uh, warmly received or it didn't garner the necessary two-thirds vote that's required. Um, so that's something that I think if you're looking at trying, trying to create a, uh, a, a viable uh, economic development in your community. You, you do want to have some regulation that you just don't have uh, the Wild West in terms of, of signage. And you, um, I'm not saying that you don't allow signs, but you should have some controls that uh, you just aren't overly stimulated with uh, uh, a preponderance of unregulated signs. So some of the corridor-wide considerations uh, we're thinking that if we do any type of, of zoning, for the most part, we'd be looking at zoning that would be in the form of overlay districts, for the most part, not everywhere, but for the most part. And the reason for that is by using overlay districts, 
as the vehicle to put new zoning in place. It allows people to retain the existing zoning that they currently have on their property. Um, and the thought was, people get nervous. Uh, you know what your zoning is now. Um, and if you start taking that away, people get nervous. You, um, so we don't want to uh, put in place uh, zoning that may feel threatening or taking away th things from, from you in terms of your existing zoning. And overlay districts uh, are sort of optional. It, it, and what we try to do is make the, um, the provisions in the overlay districts um, a little more attractive uh, for somebody to, uh, to follow. But by the same token, it, it provides the property owners uh, the security that their existing zoning is not going to be uh, taken away from them. Uh, we think that given the size of the area and the difference for the areas, uh, we should tailor regulations that are sub-area specific. Um, if some, some properties that are close to the interchange are going to be looking at a different type of market and demand from the marketplace versus um, as you go further east down uh, Route 6 or if you're on Route uh, 77, uh, so we want to uh, put zoning in place that is uh, sensitive and compatible with the particular sub-areas. We're looking at the potential for some multi-unit multi residential and mixed-use uses in the overlay districts. Uh, that means you, you might have uh, uh, multiple uses. You might have some residential with uh, commercial built-in um, and that's something that we're going to be lo looking at and we're interested in feedback from you on that. Uh, we think that some of the areas, uh, given the existing lot size that we saw on the earlier map, we may be looking at uh, putting in place perhaps some smaller minimum lot sizes. So some of the properties that now don't comply with the 60,000 square feet would be brought back in, into uh, compliance. Uh, we're looking at design standards for building facades and exteriors. We're not looking at doing a detailed design review type process, but we think we should put in place some provisions where buildings just don't have a, a cinder block wall that goes hundreds of, of feet. We'd like to see some provisions that there's um, articulations, bump outs, um, that make the buildings a little more appealing to the eye. And it's, again, simple types of uh, design guidelines can uh, really help uh, create a, a better uh, ambiance and aesthetic. Uh, we're also very much um, aware of the natural resource areas, uh, the wetland areas. We have aquifer protection areas and we want to make sure that the zoning does not uh, intrude uh, and, uh, and is protective of, of those resource areas. The um, reduce the area um, of the adult entertainment overlay district. We'll be showing you that um, later, but right now it's a, it's a long stretch along Route 6, and the thought was um, we can reduce it um, from its current size. Uh, we're thinking that uh, side and rear setbacks um, should be determined by, by building height. That is, if you have a one-story building, you maybe don't need the same type of setback as if it's a two-story building because of the visual, visual impacts. Um, and we're looking to see um, the mass Mass Dot Department of Transportation has uh, the Route 6 uh, uh, plan that looks at a lot of complete street type improvements that, that would include sidewalks, bike lanes, etc. And wherever possible, if there's ways that we can uh, make the um, zoning uh, more attractive and, and uh, conducive for better pedestrian orientation as opposed to being totally dependent on automobile, we think that's a good thing. And there's more. Uh, 
We have uh, thought that uh, making the buildings uh, solar ready, that is, they aren't required to put the solar panels on, but let's make sure a building can support it. Also, uh, perhaps the zoning should uh, be open if uh, somebody wants to put pa solar panels on parking areas, either pr new parking areas or even existing parking areas. Uh, that's a way of uh, adding more resiliency and sustainability uh, into the development practices, as well as uh, you know, cutting down on heat islands. Uh, whenever possible, there should be a look at opportunities for promoting public open space, you know, in, not only in the protected resource areas, but some upland areas might uh, be an attractive uh, uh, component of an overall development scheme. Uh, we mentioned signage, uh, look at some type of signage requirements, uh, and make the uses uh, uh, get away from the overly specific use regulations and make the use categories more general. And instead of trying to figure out every single type of, of use, which would end up being the size of a, of a dictionary if you wanted to get real specific, look at um, using performance standards. And by performance standards, that would be things such as uh, you know, traffic generation, uh, noise, Vibration, dust, um, uh, you know, what is it about the site that would make it objectionable? It's, it's not particularly the use, it's what, what does the use do? And um, an, a new way of looking at regulating uses is to look at the performance characteristics of a particular use rather than trying to identify every, every single use in the world. Uh, we're looking at uh, shared parking uh, and connectivity. That means if you have uh, two uses with parking lots next to each other, uh, is there a way to connect the parking lots so people don't have to drive out in the street to, to go to the next parking lot? They can just connect. Also looking at shared, shared parking, uh, uh, right size parking requirements, uh, there's a tendency in most zoning to uh, over require the amount of parking. Typically you find that there's a lot of unused parking spaces. So we'll be looking at uh, ways to uh, what's called right size the parking. And that might be by relaxing some of the current standards or putting in place um, uh, safety valves, release valves where uh, an applicant can demonstrate uh, to the satisfaction of the Planning Board or the Board of Appeals uh, that in a, this particular, in a specific in instance, uh, the amount of required parking is not borne out by the by the particular use in their experience. Uh, landscaping requirements in, in parking areas, I think, is something that we'd be looking at. Uh, the other thing we're looking at is trying to eliminate parking in front of buildings. How, how often do you drive down, you see a sea of parking lot in front of every building? Um, is there a way to uh, encourage buildings to be more closer to the street and to keep the parking to the side or even to the rear of the buildings? Um, one of the things we'll be talking about is uh, the unrestricted district, which right now is the um, least restricted area in town. It's basically an unrestricted area. Uh, there's some thought that we should uh, do away with that district. This would not, this is one of the instances where we're not talking about an overlay district, but to replace it with a new neighborhood residential district. And the thought was uh, the predominant use in, the, in those areas are residential. And it doesn't have real accessibility on Route 6 or any major access ways, but there is still the potential um, a use that's not terribly compatible with the existing residential uses could, could find its way in there. And so the thought was perhaps we replace the unrestricted district with a new neighborhood residential district that would give more protection to the residential uh, um, properties in, the, in that area. 
I already talked about performance standards and the, the split lot conundrum. Uh, there are a lot of properties along the Route 6 corridor that have the front in one zone and the back is in another zone. So it's in, in planning, we call that a split lot. And, and, uh, and there are certain things that you can and can't do with split lots. Uh, so we're looking at putting together something in the zoning that would allow some relief for people that do have split lot zones where you can basically let uh, one of the zoning districts uh, be extended to the rest of the of the lot. Um, so, so, yes, sir. I have, I have one question on that. Yeah. The width of the zone down the corridor, like some, I think I'm going to say it's like 700 feet. Are we looking to extend that back any? Or? No. What What we would be looking at is say, on Route Six, you have a, a what is the setback there? It's 500 feet. Five hundred feet. So the first 500 feet would be zone business and say you have another 500 feet further, say it goes 1,000 feet back. So you have 500 and 500. So under current zoning, um, if you want to do business, you can do business as long as you keep all the physical attributes of that business on the 500, the first 500 feet. You can use the back part only for what, what's called the abstract use. So you can use it in terms of calculating your minimum lot size. You can use it for setback requirements, and you can use it for lot coverage. But you can't put a parking lot in there. You can't put a driveway in there. You can't put a septic system that serves the business use in there. So that's the, that's the conundrum. And so what we would be proposing is putting a mechanism in place where if you were the owner of such a lot, you could petition uh, through a special permit to have the provisions of the business district extended further back than the 500 feet. Um, and you can either make it by a certain amount or, or make the amount flexible and up to the discretion of the planning board. But it would, there would be certain standards that would have to be followed uh, through the issuance of that special permit that it's not injurious to other abutting properties uh, and that the types of uh, uses in there are, are, are compatible with the, the neighborhood and the vision for the area. Um, have, have you looked into like, so some of those the streets are only 800 feet long, 900 feet long. Mm -hmm. have, most of those are residences in that area. Mm -hmm. So the commercial lots, well, there's some commercial lots right on the Route 6, and there's small lots, you know, some of mm -hmm. 1,000 and so forth. But, so now when you get the line that comes up 500 feet, so now you have a business that goes there, and then you got five residences behind it. So there's one or something like that. This would be only on... The, the way I would envision it be drafted is that lots that are in existence as of now have that. So people can't, um, say, say you have, this is a lot and that's a lot there. Um, and there's other lots behind you. Uh, you can only use the boundaries of the existing lot. Somebody can't buy properties next to them that's own residential and say, well, now it's next to my business, I want to extend it into those lots. No, because, uh, you know, it's basically to uh, provide people that have lots that are split zoning now the ability to expand one use into the... Most of those lots in that whole area. They don't have I mean, this, I thought you were going to defer the questions until the end. Well, we were going to see how far, how far down the rabbit's hole we're going to go with questions, but... Well, we're going down the hole. Okay. Um, so the purpose of the uh, sub-areas, uh, we want to tailor the zoning uh, so that it reflects a vision that's appropriate f for the location. Uh, we also want to be cognizant of what the market demand would be and consider the development capacity and the environmental context. By that means, you know, are there a lot of wetlands in that area? Are there, are there sensitive areas that we should be protective of? And also we want to uh, 
respect the established character of, of the area. We don't want to uh, you know, do a wholesale change and up upset the, uh, the existing flavor and character of, of particular areas. And the criteria that we used in designating the uh, sub-areas is the uh, access and the proximity to the interstate highway. That obviously is a big factor in the decision-making of, of uh, development. Uh, how much, you know, what the size and the amount of the undevelopable land? Are we looking at more redevelopment versus new development? Um, and what is the size and shape of, of the district? You know, uh, are there boundaries such as roadways, um, natural features that make it uh, the help define the area? Uh, we also looked at the frontage on Route 6 and 177 and accessibility. So those were kind of the factors that went into how, how did you come up with these uh, five areas? So I'm going to start going through the, the five areas just to give you an idea of what, what the thinking is. Um, and also, I'm just going to jump ahead a, a little bit. Um, you notice we have some, some boards uh, around the, uh, the room. And we have two boards for each of the sub-areas. And we have some, uh, some stickies and post-it notes and Sharpies. Uh, you know, after we go through the presentation, what I'd like everyone to do, um, based on what we've presented, is to take a look at the, uh, the display boards. And if you have any comments, you can put them on, uh, on post-it notes and put them right on there. And we have, um, we have stickers, colored stickers. And we're going to use the, the, the traffic light uh, method of, uh, of commenting. If you see something on the boards that you, that you like, you can hit green, because green means go. Uh, if you think something, well, you guys are crazy, are way off, um, you put a red, which means stop, um, don't do it. And if you kind of, well, maybe, um, you can put a yellow sticker on there. Uh, I think we have some, some blue stickers, um, just because that's how they came, but th they, don't, they don't mean anything. <laughs> Um, so I, I just want to jump ahead that I'm going to go through these now, but you're going to have an, another bite of the apple to, to look um, at these boards and to give us some comments. I mean, some, some people will, are, are shy about uh, speaking, and this is a way of you know, telling us uh, uh, through the dots and through your comments. So the first area, we're calling it the, the Narrows District, and this is... Um, located uh, right as Route 6 comes in off of, uh, from the F Fall River city limits. And we've got the I-95 and Route 6. And he has the prime access uh, from the interstate highway. It is a gateway to Westport. And the eastern portion down in here, there's a lot of uh, sensitive resource areas. Um, also, it's not shown here, um, uh, but the Adult Entertainment District does um, uh, overlay in here. So one of the things that we're looking at is to uh, create a uh, reduction in the size of the Adult Entertainment over Overlay District to avoid where it currently encroaches into some of the wetland resource areas. And we're looking at a type of um, business and mixed use overlay district that would uh, promote development and redevelopment. Now, a lot of this is being, um, the, the catalyst for this is that the town has been working very uh, uh, um, hard to try to get uh, water and sewer service into this, to this area. Um, you, and part of the reason is um, you have a lot of small lots with old septic systems and there's going to come a time where the septic systems aren't going to be functioning the way they should that could cause environmental degradation. 
but additionally, it prevents um, uh, development from occurring if a, if a property doesn't have the ability to uh, handle the amount of, of sewage that uh, uh, that the market is demanding. So what the town is looking to do is to put zoning in place uh, that would reflect what we would be seeing if that sewer is brought to the area. Um, but also in order to get the state assistance to extend the sewer, the state wants to know what's going on in terms of are you creating jobs, are you creating new housing, uh, you know, why should we be giving you money to extend the, the sewer? Um, and also, if you're um, helping existing property owners that may be facing down the road uh, uh, circumstances where their septic is failing and it's, um, it's difficult for them to come in compliance. So this, the second area is uh, basically uh, covers a lot of what the current science and technology overlay district is, um, which is here. And you can see a lot of this property um, doesn't have a lot of great access opportunities, which may be a reason why it has um, not gained any traction in, in the past. But it has large land areas with limited frontage. It lacks um, visibility. Be, um, I, well, you have along here, but it still lacks uh, visibility down in here. What we're looking to do is uh, keeping the science and technology overlay district in, in place, but also adding a second uh, overlay district that would be a multifamily mixed use overlay district um, that would basically would have two overlay districts uh, superimposed over the existing uh, zoning. The third area is what we're calling now a neighborhood residential district, but this area is the current unrestricted zoning area that we talked about earlier. It's the least restrictive district. It has frontage along I-95, but no access. Uh, it has no frontage along Route 6. Uh, the access is primarily da Davis Road uh, through established uh, neighborhoods. Uh, it also contains uh, aquifer protection areas and wetlands. And it has the, uh, the, the railroad right of way bisects the area as well. Uh, what we're thinking of for this area is to replace the unrestricted district, just basically take it off the books and uh, put in place a new neighborhood residential district. Um, it would allow for some um, more diverse, smaller scale housing, because uh, we think we'd like to reduce the 60,000 square foot lot size. And it would also uh, provide a, a degree of protection for the Davis Road neighborhood and other properties um, that currently, um, with the unrestricted uh, designation right now, that you somebody could come in and say, well, I want to put uh, such and such a place there. And so that's the thinking on, on that particular area. <coughs> now, this area is the community mixed use zoning, which is basically all of Route 6 uh, going down uh, east of Highway 88 and along the north side of 177. Uh, we haven't included this area because that's, that's going to become sub-area 5, and I'll get to that uh, right after this. But this is the current um, linear business district that has frontage on Route 6 and 177. And it's a mi currently it's a mixture of commercial and residential uses. Um, many of the lots are in split zoning districts that we talked about earlier. Uh, and this is an area where we're thinking um, the zoning 
the zoning that's in place here is basically the same business zoning that's in place for, for down, you know, the town center. And we'd like to see the zoning uh, for this area upgraded to reflect uh, what we think this area would be in the, in the future. So we'd like to see, you know, to allow for commercial and residential mixed uses, um, get away from a sea of asphalt um, in the front of the buildings, uh, connectivity uh, and, and zoning in place that we talked about for the split lot zones. And so the last sub area is the intersection of Route 6 and 177. And this area was once known as, as Factory Village. And it's the gateway uh, to Westport uh, from the east. And what we'd be looking at is providing a mixed use overlay district that would allow for business shops, residential uses. Um, we talked earlier about you know promoting walkability that we think uh, this is probably an area that has the greatest potential for that type of um, element. Accommodate a mixture of business types that are pedestrian scale and friendly. Uh, encourage uses that, that serve the area residents and also to provide for open space amenities. So the design guidelines we talked about earlier, uh, reduce front yard setbacks. Uh, building materials, uh, you know, gets into the, the facades of, of buildings. Do you, you know, do you just want split, split block masonry? Um, so uh, we'd like to see, uh, you know, more articulation. Uh, try to keep it more of a human scale uh, when appropriate. Uh, pr large, promote large areas of undifferentiated blank facades talked about solar energy, uh, expressed architectural elements. That means to uh, get away from just stretches of, of, of straight walls with nothing on them. Um, make it bicycle friendly, uh, consider shade and shadow impacts, and also uh, encourage sustainable design elements, uh, uh, making buildings a, a lead certifiable um, and does the town now have the uh, stretch code, stretch billing code? So that's a, a good step already towards that. So these are some of the, you know, I, I threw around some of the, you know, mixed use, multifamily, residential. These are the types of development that the advisory committee has been envisioning in terms of what they would like to see uh, the zoning try to accomplish. Um, and it's a multifamily residential that isn't overpowering. It, it, it's multifamily, but it does have a lot of uh, residential, uh, single family kind of flavor characteristics to it. You can see that here as attached townhouses. Um, and on the retail side, you can use some uh, architectural elements and gables and articulation to create a much more attractive uh, retail environment. And this is a uh, village retail mixed use type of situation where you may have uh, more publicly type uses on the ground floor retail service. Um, and on the above you could have offices or even uh, residential as, as potential uses. And this is another example of village office. Um, hospitality, uh, you know, they don't have to be blocky, stodgy type of buildings. You can make some hospitality uses. Uh, child care is a potential. And perhaps even some uh, indoor soccer or other athletic type facilities um, might be potential types of uses. So. The next steps, um, I mentioned we have the sub-district display board, so uh, when we finish up, why don't we, um, we have some refreshments as well as the display board, so why don't you take some time to 
uh, take a look at the display boards and Could you take questions before that? Oh, we can take some questions before that if you want, and we can take some questions afterwards too, okay? Because what my concern is, is that I live in a North End, and I'm not happy about any of this. Now, why are we building up on Route 6? Why are we turning ourselves into a document or a behavior? We like living in Westport because mm -hmm. it is a rural community. Mm -hmm. I am not going to make any money off this, but I'm going to have a lot of traffic. I'm going to have a lot of problems. I, you, things are going to change. And I'm not happy with that. Now, people who are going to make money, yes. And it seems like you people want to really control what the homeowners do. Oh, we got to make it look nice. we got to do this. It's going to cost people a lot, a lot of money. Now, where's this money coming from? You make all these rules and regulations. And I wonder how many people sitting here if they would raise their hand, how many people sitting here live in the North End? Yes, exactly. That's why we're here. You know, so we need to be careful about what's controlled and not controlled. So this is not, why do we need to do this? Westport is a rural community. Why do we want all these shops and buildings and all this, oh, make it look pretty. Why? So we, we don't have to drive all the way to Fall River to get something. So you don't want to drive to Fall River? You don't want to drive five minutes? Drive. I just said, why drive all the way to Fall River? You shouldn't have to. You have Route 6 right there. Route 6 is a commercial district. That's what you should be used for. If you don't like it, you should move further south or something. Well, why don't we keep the comments coming to, to, coming to us instead of... Well, how many... Um, how much are we going to be building up commercially the rest of Westport. Why is it always the north end of Westport? Because a lot of times promises are made to us and a lot of promises are made and then later on down the road, things change. Well, part of the reason is you have an interstate highway that goes the north part. There's not an interstate highway that goes to the south part of Westport. Mm -hmm. you, have a, you have a situation where you have smaller lots that have been on septic for, for decades and there's concern that the, the shelf life of these septic systems is coming to an end. And the need for public sewer ex exists to serve those, those residences, maybe not now, maybe not five years from now, but some, at or some point. maybe not 10 or 20 years from now. This is, this is a long-term situation because bringing the sewer in first is going to be uh, the, the town is looking to expand the store, but they're trying to do it in a way that they get maximum s state assistance. And in order to, to do that, they have to demonstrate to the state that they have a plan in place as to... Uh, they will... That, that's getting that's getting into a technical question. That's right 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 now. I think. It's yeah, it's yes or no. Do, they, do we have to tie in? Five years after it passes by the front of your house. It depends how it depends how we get. Depends how we get the sewer goes by the front of your house. Five years later, you have to tie in. And they don't pay a sewer bill into perpetuity, even if you put in a brand new septic system in the last few years. That's right. You got five years. So I paid. I, I when I purchased my house, the town mandated that I put in a brand new septic system three years ago when I purchased it in 2020. Now they're going to mandate that I don't use the brand new septic system that they made me put in. Yes. Do I have that right? Well, yes. it would take a few years for it to go by your place to begin with, mm -hmm. and then you would have five years after that. Mm -hmm. And, that, but, and it would cost years. you thirty or forty thousand dollars. It's thirty-one thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. Thirty-one thousand dollars, and then I'm not going to be able to use the brand new septic exactly. system that the town exactly. made me put in yes. because I'm going to have to pay the town exactly. then a monthly fee into perpetuity or an annual yes. fee, however yes. they're going to construct it, right. into right. perpetuity exactly. to to bypass the brand new septic system exactly. that I. Septic put in. systems are set to fail at the long period of time. They could increase the size of the tank that you would need on that system. Therefore, it would require automatic. There's a lot of contradictions in yes, this. Yes, um, yes. You, you, you want to build up Route 6. And I'm not saying that I'm, and I live, I live there, but I, I'm not generally opposed 
to that. But when you tell me that you want to build up the businesses along Route 6, and then also put in a bike path along Route 6, what, what, how, how do how that's like that, that's kind of a weird dichotomy to me that I don't see those two things jiving together. Well, the bike path in the complete streets is coming from Mass Dot, and Mass Dot has been very um, active in promoting what they call complete streets, which means uh, whenever possible, you provide as for as many modes of transportation as possible. So, the plans that they have proposed thus far all show traffic lanes, bike lanes, and sidewalks. How many? How many? How many lanes? How many travel lanes for vehicles? I think it goes from two to uh, one with uh, with with uh, turn. You know, turning pockets. Jim, on the planning board part about it, what did they decide on the new road that's supposed to go down Route 6? How many lanes? Is it still two on each side? Is it going down to one lane? It is uh, not determined. Um, it, it's, it's really the state who is going to do it, and the state is now working with Dartmouth and Westport and everybody along Route 6, really to figure out what they're going to do. But I, I don't expect uh, that they're going to come up with a plan for another two or three years. Well, the, the projection of the project was... Th that, that's one option. That One option is to slow the traffic down on Route 6 and have two major lanes, each one each way, with a bike path and uh, sidewalks as well. You're all about and increasing business traffic yes. while decreasing the amount of lanes to travel in? And you, you need to slow down the traffic on Route 6. I agree with that. It's, I'm, it's I'm, dangerous. Well, that. And the way to do that is to narrow the lanes or to reduce the lanes to one each direction. While with with turning forward. With turning places. You know, it is uh, really out of our hands. We ha Westport has had their input to this process. They came for public hearings and public process uh, last year here in Westport and in Dartmouth. And uh, with also I wanted to say about the sewer. Um, if the sewer comes, uh, it'll be either a district and they will determine what the uh, rules are or it'll be a municipal system and the sewer commission will decide if you have just put in a septic system, uh, you may have to pay a betterment as it goes by your house, but you may not have to tie in until the, the life of your system is already done. So that could be 20 years. I don't know what it's gonna be, because we're not the sewer commission, and there isn't a sewer commission yet. It's just the select board who acts as a sewer, sewer commission. But those issues are not what we're talking about here. We're trying to anticipate that the sewer is going to come someday, and we want to get zoning in place that would make sense of what we have. And it isn't to build up Route 6 is to make sense of Route 6. Right now, there's, there's no sense to it. You have the businesses that you have are uh, car lots because the car lots don't need sewer. And so if you have the center part, I can't remember which section that is, um, three? Yeah. The third subsection is the middle section from Route 88 down to close to Forge Road. So that is part of the system, that the report that we had from 18 years ago that said that that section is a mixed use of small retail operations and residential, and that's what we want to expand. And the section from 88 to Fall River is mostly all commercial, and that's where we want commercial development. And Westport really needs some commercial development Why? because all we're relying on now is, is uh, residential taxes. And it would be nice to have some, some diversity in our tax base, but. So yeah, yeah. Where, whereabouts on Route 6 do you live? 
Sorry? Whereabouts and where, whereabouts do you live? I live off of Washington Street. Okay, and, and which side? Towards, towards 195 or the opposite side? Uh, Washington Street only is in no, the right. from Route 6. Okay, so yeah. you're right on, on what? Okay, so I, I'm on the opposite side. So I, I'm on the plane and board with Jim and I'm also a selectman. I, I live off of Crane Street, but I, I mm -hmm. actually access the opposite side. So that's why when I was making some of the questions that, that um, David asked me to stop, is because of those neighborhoods. What we're trying to do is we're trying to responsibly redevelop. Um, and I mean, we have the Serpent Study, we have two of them, and they're pretty much the same. And, and I really think like all the people in, in Westport, what, I think we're gonna have another thing later on in the year a little bit too, right? Yeah. We should read that study, okay? Because one of my concerns was like, I'm very familiar with your side, your side and, and you, you have that like the strip plaza over there and there's another big piece of land behind you and, and there was one right behind you that was for sale and I'm watching the value of what, what's happening with that. And how, how long have you lived up over there? Uh, 50 years. Okay. Do, you, do, you, do you have a compliant Title five system? Yes. Okay, so you don't have a cesspool any longer. When, when was... I ha what I have is um, the holding tank and uh, leaching here. The, okay. I own two acres of land. And, and, and right now, the way things, the way things stand, um, you, you'll never have to upgrade, you wouldn't have to upgrade that system um, if a pat, like, until you sell it. But they, they did create a bylaw right. that if you had a cesspool, within two years, you, you, you have to upgrade. So like when you purchased your house, you didn't, it didn't pass Title V. Correct. Right? So that's one of the, and that was done in 1995. So it gave these seniors, or people that, like my mother that bought a house in 63, and, and then, you know, she retired, she's 80, and she re retired when she was 62, but she had a cesspool, but it's not a public health threat. The DEP says it can stay there. But the Board of Health created that regulation, and that's what they've been doing in this, in this neighborhood. And, and I seen a two lot, a two bedroom house in, those letters went out, and that person put a sixty-five thousand dollars septic system, and she's retired. So there's some federal things that just happened with PFAS contamination. That Route Six, the water main was put in, you know, almost four years ago, I guess. And that's our real issue on Route Six is we need to get the water because so many of us in that area we don't have good drinking water. So we need to get the water and the sewer up. And I'm not looking. I, I, the water's I, not good because I haven't heard of anybody that has bad water with our wells. Well, we, we've uh, we've had so many systems. One of the things when they when they do the when they when they when they were making them change from cesspool and they do the do the assessment because the bylaw said that you could do a compliant Title V if you weren't doing an expansion, just doing a repair. And so what they did was, and the board of health has a lot of data on it. What they did was they. They tested the well and it had contamination, and so they made them. They made them do the system, but they didn't do anything about the well. And we have Are they running? You've been talking about sewage. They have not mentioned running water. It, 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 it's, a whole, it's a whole. It's a whole plan of water. So we, we have um, we have an integrated water plan, and we also have a master plan. And, and, uh, and I, I was on that. So we've, what, what our problem with, with Route 6 is since that water main went in, that was from some, some contamination from- The gas station no, that had- No, it wasn't been. from the gas station. And I talked to the person from the DDP. There's a super fun site in Dartmouth. And, and, and actually, the DDP paid, paid for that water main from that. So when the water main came in, they dead ended it. And what happens is when the water sits there stagnant, we don't have enough use on the water. So it sits there stagnant. They have to keep blowing it off. So we have the, the major issue is, is we need to get the water up there. And now different regulations, you, you can't just bring the water without the sewer. And this federal, this year, the federal government started this PFAS regulation stuff, and we've been determined that we're in an environmental injustice neighborhood. So there's going to be a lot of this, this federal money that we're going to try to go at to fix this. But a big reason to run the water and sewage is to have more businesses on Route 6. I, That's the plan. I, I, I understand. And I'm and not going to make money <coughs> off that, but I'm going to be really I'm, What I'm looking for, what, what my vision is, and so so my, my grandmother grew up on Union Street in the 20s. Mm -hmm. okay? I get the stories of the trolley cars going down there yeah. and all that stuff. 
one of the things that, that I envision, I don't, we're not going to be dominant, and I don't want, I don't want it to be dominant, and I don't think anybody in this room wants it to be dominant. We want to have some responsible development, and that was the reason I was questioning that strip section over here. So I'm, I'm in that section, and, and you uh, you come in 500 feet, and then the road dead ends 500 feet, and then we're gonna we're gonna put uh, mixed use up on the road so it looks nice up on the road, and then. I don't want to make sure that we don't have parking lots behind that for them residents that are in, you know, in the back that somebody comes in commercially in that mixed use district. We need to figure out how commercial will fix the neighbors in the back. Because we'll have right. serious, that, that, serious that's problems. why we're proposing special permit right. because it gives the discretion. So, and I mean, like I said, the real problem is we need to get water there. And we're, we need, we're going to need to get sewer. And I think what's, what's and, and I've been involved in this process for about four or five years. I think what's, what's going on here is we're trying to create this zoning because the, the water and sewer is going to come. I mean, with this, this federal government regulation and all the stuff that's happening, it's going to come, and we're trying to, we're trying to responsibly control what's going to happen to all it's our It's all neighbors. the other stuff beyond but, the sewer. But I'm glad you came tonight, and, and I, need you, I need everybody to spread the word on that stuff because... This is going to go to town meeting. No, but nothing's going to be decided right now. It's going to go to town meeting. And what we don't need is what's happened for the last, you know, 40 years. It goes to town meeting and it gets voted down because I'm, I'm telling you what's going to happen. If the sewer doesn't go, these $65,000 septic systems for these cesspools, and, and I have no problem with that. If, if it was to be transferred when the person that bought it in the 60s, who's retired now on fixed income, could wait until they, they, they sold souls, you know, passed away, transferred it to, and that's how it was supposed to happen. That's how it's supposed to happen. Another thing with all this development and buildings and, and um, we're talking families and apartments and stuff like that, the new, new, our new middle school, high school, is at capacity. Now you're talking about putting in all these other buildings and oh, more people, and then where are, what are we gonna do? They're gonna have kids. Again. Like the way I vision, we have a lot of environmental. Like, there's a lot of wetlands in that area. There is all of that stuff. But it's just the, the developments again. It's not going to be done. Uh, you know, I, I think we should try to like. Well, I think the like I think I think the reason we're we're doing the zoning because if w water and sewer comes in, that's going to be a catalyst for development. And if you don't have the proper regulations in place. It's, you, you don't have any control over what gets developed. And leaving things, sticking your head in the sand now and saying, well, we'll just leave the zoning alone and uh, we'll let the water and sewer come in and everything will be hunky-dory. It won't. Without, without proper zoning in place, you may see a lot of changes that you don't want you and can't control. 100% accurate. I agree with you there. My bigger concern is the infrastructure. If you're going to have the amount of traffic flow that you can contain on Route 6 and expect to increase the business potential of Route 6, that's a contradiction. It's not going to work. And you've got school buses, you've got tractor trailers, and now you're going to, you're going to invite and I mean, actively seek out yes. more businesses, more retail businesses into this, into this area, but then eliminate half of the travel ways? I mean, that's insane. I thought the bus was well, going to be able to pull over on the side of the road. That's I can, I, again, well, again, that, that, is, that is something that it's a state jurisdiction highway, and the state is very much um, promoting complete streets. And as Jim said, they haven't decided on anything yet. I, and I, I really wish you guys would have bring those brought those, cross, cross, the, the, the study. The cross study. sections. Because, because like the, the things that you're saying, they address that type of stuff. So some of this stuff, the Route, the route 6 layout right now is, is, is wide. And you got you know, two lanes on the each yeah. side. We, that, that drop off stuff, is, which is the turnaround, which is a major problem, all the accidents that we have. So this, again, this thing's been studied to death. And, 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 and the study is, when I saw it, you know, when I got on the board and, and we, were, we were doing the master plan review and I, and I saw the study from 15 years ago, and I'm like, our biggest problem is we have an excellent 
study, but nobody's implemented anything. And, and it's kind of like, because they didn't get the information. If, if, if everybody got to see the, I thought the study was, and again, I, you know, I got the stories from my grandmother, you know, taking a horse and sleigh to visit her grandmother in Little Compton. Um, that's how they went back that way, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I, I envision, you know, some eateries and stuff like that. And, and hopefully, you know, the sections, sections of it are a little more commercial than the mixed use area, like where we live down that area. I, I, and, and the study addresses that. Um, I don't think, and I, would, I don't think we should be in Bristol, Rhode Island, be, be scaring, the scaring them. No, but they, they, they do the study and, 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 and yeah. the road will bend a little bit more and it's going to it's gonna slow traffic down. That's, I don't know why Mass Highway doesn't slow traffic down because it's, you know, you got 50, 50 miles an hour. Like you get the dock coming down that hill and you can't see nothing and it's 50 miles an hour. So why can't we put it 40? So this stuff's going to slow it down where we're talking the sidewalks and, and all of that type of stuff. I, I really think like I if we would have had a little bit more of that on the zoning, but they're just this zoning stuff, we're just trying to make it fit with what's gonna what's gonna gonna happen. Because when the sewer comes it's gonna generate it's gonna be I, I think there's gonna be more residential stuff too, because people will be able to expand to their house. Um, the smaller lot size the cost. I mean nobody right now, if if you had to put that, you know, with the inflation that we have going on right now, and, and these systems are costing sixty-five thousand dollars. I'm, I'm, a, I can guarantee it to you, but I would believe that it's not going to be sixty-five thousand dollars to hook up into the, into the sewer system. Well, then you pay for the rest of your life. Well, so uh, we, have, we have a gentleman in the back that has a question. Yes, sir. Question regarding new septic systems. You put them in, and I'm told you have to maintain them and have them tested. Every year after that, or every two years, is that correct? Three years. Every three years. So now, even if you put your own septic system in, and two people I know have done it in 65 and 68,000 feet, and now you still have to have a test. So that money doesn't go away. So now you're going to put a septic system in. If we don't get water through it, and by the way, I do currently own a lot on Route 6, but I'm close enough to be concerned. I have had brought in Route 6 before, and I'm tired of paying just like you on me. I don't blame you one bit, but. I will say this, too much of a good thing is a bad thing, and that's the bottom line. And they want to put this other new septic system and jam it down our throat because that's not even state by law from my understanding, that's a town by law, and they're jamming that extra 30 grand up down our throat. So if you're worried about the soil that's going to make it high end and measure the front of you three acres of property, you should be worried about the septic system that we have in this town that the regulations that are jammed down our throat that are making us put them in and spend 15000 more, I mean, excuse me, and 30000 more. And then the problem with it is, from what I understand, and my nephew just did it, he just was complaining to me, he's an excavation guy, and his cost, his cost was $19,000 by the unit. That was his cost with his discount. That's not sticking shovels on the ground, that's not material, that's anything else. And regulations are wonderful. But the problem is you have no communication from one thing to the other, in my opinion. And if it's not state, if it's not state handling, why are we doing the best work? So right. it's not just going to stop, I don't think, at your septic system or my septic system. And we can't stop the state. I understand that. Yes, but we not. can't stop everything else. Okay. You have the United System, or you just did a regular Title Five report? Title Five. Okay. So, this, okay. This so system yeah, I, I, the, well, I got to explain this because this is you, you need to know what's if the sewer doesn't come, this is happening. So any new construction, they, this is a bylaw that the Board of Health, uh, not a bylaw, a regulation that the Board of Health. If this didn't go to town meeting to be approved. When the DEP was talking about doing it statewide in the areas that they were going to do it in, and, and this got shot down, um, they said it would go to town meeting. Our Board of Health put this regulation, and there was a hundred and something letters sent out telling, telling people with cesspools that they had to change it in two years. They just voted to extend it two more years because of the talk of the sewer. But the problem with these systems are, the bylaw says any new construction, you have to put it in. So already, you know, my daughter that's going to build a house, she's already $65,000 on this lot. When, when it it would have been, you know, because I'm in the excavating business, and I could have done at my cost for $10,000.
but now I got to add a nineteen thousand dollar component to this. That the other thing with this with this component is Title V says forty thousand square foot lot will take care of the, the, nitr the nitrification. We have a bylaw that's sixty thousand square feet, so you can't put it on, on that. So these these lots, these smaller lots, they were made for the D nine, but they they passed the bylaw that said you not by law regulation because it's not a town thing it's a it's a it's a board of health regulation that all new construction you have to put this on so you, you're spending your money and you don't even need it because the sixty thousand square foot lot takes care of the nitrification in our area what top of, so what's up of what's what top is not even a, a, okay. a nitrogen sensitive Manny, Manny, Manny. I, I, I got a little bit scared. You're giving misinformation. No, I'm not. You are okay. Hold, hold it, hold it, hold it. You're interrupting me. David, David. 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 Well, can I finish one more question? You've been talking for about 20 minutes. Okay. It's, it's a public forum. Are you running the meeting? These are my neighbors. I, well, I don't want to talk to them in the neighborhood. Okay, okay, both of you. So the denitrification system is also, you have an electric bill. That's that's like probably hundred and twenty dollars more a month right now. And what he was talking about the inspections, you have that because you don't have one of those systems, you they monitor and you have to pay sixteen hundred dollars a year to have them come and test your system every year it sends to be tested. So so you got twelve hundred, sixteen hundred, what's that? Every year more that's what you're paying. So when you say you gotta pay the sewer? Manny. I'm not paying that. Thank you. I, mean, I, know, I, I know that's just me. Okay, yes. Manny, thank you. I just, I just oh, go ahead, want to make sure that we're not getting sidetracked on Board of Health issues, because this is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about rezoning. So, Betty? Yes, um, I'd like some information on the uh, impact on the needs for planning and development, et cetera, that is coming from light rail because I've read that there are going to be requirements for towns to develop plans to deal with the fact that people are going to be moving down uh, from Boston and that are, those areas. So currently, uh, we're not, the legislation does not call out Westport uh, for being required to uh, zone an area in town for, because they're an adjacent community. But we may be required in the future to do that. What does that mean? And it means uh, a normal adjacent community has to zone uh, 50 acres that, is, that you can uh, have 15 units per acre of housing. And uh, we're not required to do that currently. Uh, and if we are required, if they change the legislation, uh, we may be required uh, as a small town adjacent community, which would mean that we have to have uh, a zone where we can have 15 units per acre for 5% of our current housing stock, which would be about 350 units. It doesn't mean that we have to build them, but we have to have a place that can accommodate that. And um, don't know where that would be currently, but uh, we, would, we are thinking about it, but currently uh, we're not required to do that. Can I ask something about affordable housing also? Are there any requirements for affordable housing or are you thinking about that within any of these areas? Um, that's something that can be considered. Uh, in terms of the state program that you referred to, yeah. um, a, a town can do up to 10% affordable. They need to do. They can. It's their option under the that that state provision, for, you know, for the um, you know mass transit. Um, f the town right now, um, you're include you have do have some inclusionary zoning currently that's applicable in town, and that's a 10 percent, Jim. That's currently 10 10 percent requirement. So if you do over a certain number of units, you're required to have 10 percent of the units affordable. Um, We'll, 
we'll probably use that as our baseline for any type of inclusionary zoning with respect to the Route 6 area going forward. There's a, there's a kind of an interesting dynamic in that the, um, the higher you make the amount, if you go, well, let's do, you know, some communities say, well, let's do 20, 25 percent affordable. What happens is you then discourage the production of housing because developers will only go up to the number of units where they don't have to do any, any affordable housing. And so you, you, you basically lose out in that you don't get as much housing production as you could and you don't get any affordable. So I might. West Port's uh, affordable housing is very low. Mm -hmm. The percentage is way below 10% right now as it's HSI. So I mean, we expect to be doing affordable housing and I would think in this area it's possible. Um, it doesn't have to be, it could be something like temperature, village. Right. Um, so r right now it would be at a 10 percent. The state average for occlusionary zoning is 15 percent. And very, very few communities go above that um, because it just is not financially feasible for, for developers to do that. The only exception would, would be if it's a 40B, um, they require 25 percent but they also require that the developer be a, a, a limited profit entity to reflect the fact that, um, um, so that's, that's how that works out. But um, my understanding working with the, the advisory committee is that they want to continue uh, having a, an affordable element included in any residential over, over a certain amount. Obviously a one and a two family home uh, you know, it's, they typically are not uh, included for inclusionary housing, but when you start getting into multifamily, six, seven, eight, nine, ten units, you do start looking at affordables. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. When you talk about these protected areas, we all know the little on Route 6, there's a lot of wetlands, a lot of flooding. Mm -hmm. Due to some development, my property now floods, it's now upland, and which was uplands my grandparents lived there. What assurance do we have with all this development? Water has to go somewhere. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not going to have more wetlands. The storm drain pipe is going to come down Route 6 when the state does it for Route 6. Well, I hope so because water. my property got destroyed by one of those businesses. No, I don't blame you. No, but the two big issues that we find in a new development is traffic and, and stormwater. And right now, stormwater is. Um, standards are being increased as, as we speak, partly because we're, you know, the 10 year storm is, seems to be happening every, every couple of years, and the 100 year storm seems to be happening every five or 10 years. So, a, a lot of the standards in terms of doing stormwater analysis and design is in a flux right now where they are getting uh, more conservative in terms of how they do their stormwater studies and what type of uh, uh, mitigation that has to be put in place. So we all have insurances that this will be done and we're not going to flood out because I have flooding now. Yes. I never did. My yes. grandparents never had it. I've been the same property. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ma'am, you had a question? Um, two things. One, um, I'm, I'm on the Board of Health and I just want to say that a lot of information about the new Board of Health regulation is inaccurate that was presented earlier. I won't get into the details now because it's not the subject of the meeting. Mm -hmm. But I would ask uh, for consideration if you are thinking about um, decreasing the lot size in some of the districts, mm -hmm. that that be tied to the ad, you know, the coming of sewer. Because Westport, you have 40,000 square feet is lot is assuming that there's no private well on the lot. Mm -hmm. Most of Westport is on private wells, so there is a more significant impact of septic mm -hmm. on small lots. So um, it would seem to make sense if you're going to shrink lot sizes, lot size requirements in some areas, that that not occur until the advent of sewer, which will um, address the environmental impact mm -hmm. of smaller lot sizes. Thank, that, you. thank you for, for, your, for your comment. 
had a question. Yes, sir. Uh, getting over to the adult entertainment uh, uh, district, it currently now is uh, uh, 13 lots, which the town owns five of those. So it now brings it down to, say, eight lots, which could be privately owned. Oh. If you went ahead and reduced the size of that, that would be spot zoning. And so that would why, why would that be spot zoning? Because the district itself cannot be located in one spot. You're already down to eight lots. That's right? not true. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. People think that if you have a one lot in its spot zoning, that's not what spot zoning that, is. That's what you would be doing if you reduced the zone. You'd be spot zoning it. Therefore, you would leave the town off with financial troubles. I, I think we could get an answer to that from your town council, but... Yeah, I think so, too. But I think... I, I th so you're telling me you can spot zone adult entertainment? Is that what you're telling me? What? Because if it is, it's not true. I don't think it's spot zoning. You don't think so? No. It's down to eight lots in the whole town of Westport. It's not spot zoning if you reduce the size of that down. No. It's not spot zoning. No. I would have to disagree with you. Okay. Thank you. Can I just say something about the stormwater? <clears throat> so. I, I also I also own like a thousand feet of Brenton Chief Brook, so um, that was one of the one of the problems where they claimed the most contaminated section with nitrogen. Okay, so the biggest problem with the bread and cheese brook is stormwater runoff from those things. So you got that you, you have the culvert up next to wind water. Um, the drainage, I, I don't know, I, I think I think during Roosevelt's time it was only built in six. So the drainage is that's a problem. They came they came in and just, I think part of that section was just a wetland that they built in when they built it and they had a trolley path going through there. So that, that, and all of this stuff was done before the Wetlands Protection Act. And we, we have a, a totally inadequate drainage system. That, and that's part of the problem, is the drainage needs to be addressed. And that's the state of it. One of the things that, that kind of baffles me when we're going forward with the sewer is, um, when, you, when you build a road, you need to put the infrastructure in. So we need to put the sewer. Well, first off, the thing we need most was, was the water main. Because if you look at the integrated water plan, in which everybody that lives in, on Route 6 should look at that plan. And, and even the, even the, the master plan. Um, and, and I know David was very instrumental in working on that master plan. We, I, I think we have a great master plan, and, and, we, and we have an integrated water plan that shows these problems. And that's why we're trying to address it. And, and just to go to the Board of Health, yes. Um, her nitrogen regulation belongs on small lots that could never be tied to sewer. There's places like the Let and Cabin's Neck, that's where they belong. They don't belong on, on our, on our 60,000 square foot lots, and, and, it, and it doesn't belong. Because we need a, an integrated water plan, that's what the state wanted us to do. So these lots that need to be addressed by sewer and water get addressed by sewer and water. And, and we we're trying to responsibly develop it so if something doesn't like what you're afraid of that's what we don't want to happen so at the same time bring revenue into the town responsibly developing it and i don't want to displace any people like you that you know we we need those neighborhoods too i want to push those neighborhoods out and i think the circuit plan did that and i mean i took the time to read it and, and you talk to your friends and your neighbors read that plan and, and we're just trying to do this the right way without you know, this, this septic up there in those areas that we got sewer coming in, and, and we, our neighbors have spent millions of dollars already. I thought the septic system going to, uh, the uh, sewerage house now. We, we have a design right now from, from Fall River to Bob. It's complete. Okay. We just, we just don't have the money to do it. It's, it's complete. But all these businesses that you want to come to Westport, it, it affects everything. Now you've got more roads to plow. Now you've got more children in the system. It's a lot of other things that go along with this. Again, I don't keep well, when the circuit study look at it, it's not going to. It's not going to change that. I lived in Dallas for many years. What? And, and I, I moved there like 1989 when they first started this stuff. Not when the first mall was done, but if you lived in the six, you know when the other. Target and all of that stuff mm -hmm. that's like getting built in. And we don't that, want that. That's not going to happen. We don't We're want that. That's not going to happen. No, and, and oh, that's. Good. I'm glad you said that, even though you said it quiet. <laughs> could we? 
Yes. yes. I think your point's well taken. From what I understand from the discussion tonight, basically you're saying that we need to plan because these things are going to happen. We it's going to happen one way or the other. It's going to happen. We need to plan for it. And your input, everybody's input is important. Um, but we're not going to stop it. Life doesn't stop. And I don't but I don't think it. it's going to, you know, the point is we're not doing things to attract more. It's what is going to happen in the future. It's just the way it is. The and you want to be ready, ready for it. But the presentation, everything we the world is so we can get more businesses, so we can get more people. Well, I would so like for them to clarify that. I, I think yeah. it's a very that's important a concern that yeah. I have. That, that's what I heard as well, was that they yeah. were trying to drum up more business. And again, I'm not, I'm not necessarily opposed to that. But there has to be a structure, an infrastructure in place before you do that so that people have access to these businesses and we're not creating gridlock like what Bristol did with Medicom Avenue by putting in a single lane in each direction and a turning lane in the middle. And now from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. every single day, including Saturday and Sundays, you can't get up Medicom Avenue. And I don't want Route 6 to turn into that. And I don't think anybody does. No. But if we go down to a single lane in each direction and then try and incorporate more businesses into that area where we've just have the, the amount of traffic that we can, can, we can carry, yeah. uh, again, it sounds like a contradiction to me. Yeah. So with, with regard to traffic and infrastructure, uh, as I said before, this is the state is going to decide what, where, and then have more public input on their plan. But... I would think that they would take a page from what we're trying to do here and take the area from Route, 6, Route 88 on Route 6 to Fall River that's already mostly commercial and have the, the road system accommodate whatever is there. So it may be that that is still four, you know, two lanes in each direction in that area. It may not be sidewalks because it's all commercial. But as you get from 88 towards Dartmouth, that is currently mixed use, as you know. I mean, it's mostly, it's, it's a mix of residential and uh, some small businesses. And I can't see that changing into Dartmouth. We don't have the land or the places for that kind of development. What we have is the ability to have housing and small retail or small commercial operations that are for the benefit of the neighborhood. So that, you know, there might be delis, there might be small restaurants. And right now you can't have those businesses very easily because there's no water and sewer. And if you have a pedestrian friendly neighborhood friendly part of Route 6 that goes from there towards Dartmouth, I think that is going to be for the benefit of everybody who lives there, and it's going to be a more, it's going to be a nicer place. You can walk across the street instead of taking your life in your hands trying to cross Route 6. It'll be safer to turn direction, to turn from one, you know, turn left on Route 6, because right now it's crazy. And uh, there'll be places for buses to turn off and in some locations, there's probably going to be street parking in front of businesses if that is what is what they're going to do. So I think, you know, as as Manny said, you really need to read the Serpid report from 2005 and the other ones too. It talks about what we should, what they suggest we should do with those areas, and when. You say that we're going to be trying to get more businesses. Yes, we're going to try to get more businesses from 88 to Fall River because that's where they are. And also in the Science and Technology Overlay District, the big uh, over there, uh, that orange area. And so I, I think that those things, the, the road system there will accommodate whatever goes there. And it should be for the benefit of the town, and it should be for the benefit of the residents. And from there, east, it will still be mixed use, but it'll be, make more sense. You know, the zoning that we have is ancient. It's from years and years ago, 
when the whole area was different. You know, Route 6 was made as a highway. And I know people live on it, but they're living on an old 1920s highway. And that isn't a really good way to live. I mean, you need to have calmer traffic. You need to have the ability to, to cross the street, walk down a sidewalk, go to a store without having to drive. So I, I think all these things that we're trying to do do make sense, but we want your input. And the discussion about septic systems and everything is while it's a related issue, it isn't what we're talking about here. So. Well, why don't we now, um, one more, yes, sir. So just to recap one thing, if I stood, if I understood this correctly. So when you say the, 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 the lots, if you own lots consecutively on the long room six and it was 500 feet back from there, mm -hmm. you're saying that the person owns the front lot, because I forget the name of the street, I don't really forget it. You, you own one lot here, and then if a commercial place wants to come in and buy up and, and go back 500 feet, you know, did they get the same you correctly? They can't do that? that Correct. Right? Okay, so the next question I got is, can they go lateral? And they go along with it, just like CVS, the, the way I the way I envision it is it's relief of existing lots, and it's not. If if what you're talking about, what I'm I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm okay, if somebody has business in the front and residential in the back of their lot. No, I mean what I'm saying is. is they can, what you're talking about is they have to go come in and get a zoning change. No, 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 and that's not what I'm saying. No. CBS was putting me as a goal. I'm sorry, I just don't be difficult. I'm just trying to understand. So if you have two lots that are side by side yes, and they have zoning that goes 500 feet back yes. and they have l land to the back. No, sir. I would, I'm talking, if a, if a place like CBS came in and said, seeing how you can't go back like you just said, that was my first part of the question. If someone wants, if someone comes in, commercial place comes in and says, okay, you know, because this is a concern that you, we, we don't want to be documented, right? We don't want to be targeted. So if somebody wants to come in, and buy, like CBS did, they bought the house in the corner, then they bought the next house, and they bought the other. Are we trying to put something in to stop that as well? No. Or no. That, you, okay. th there's nothing zoning can do to stop people. The, zoning does not deal so with ownership. Back the parking thing versus the back of the building versus, you know. I mean, if they if they well, bought the way you do though, right? Excuse because, excuse me. But I'm sorry. If if you if somebody comes in and does a land assemblage, this, the, the zoning zoning can't stop people from selling or buying property. That's what I'm saying. That that was my question. If you 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 phrase it way more fancy than I do, but if if someone comes in and decides they want to buy buy this lot, that lot, this lot, that, and they want to put up a ten thousand square foot building, they can do it now. If, I, I do understand that, but I was wondering, I thought you had said by not being able to use those other lots later on after this comes in about putting all the parking behind the building. I think that's lot. behind the 500 feet, so. Oh, behind the, that's my problem. Right? No, it's, behi it's behind the 500 feet. Yeah, I just uh, didn't understand what you were saying. Yeah, that's right. Where I did hit that yeah. So what, what he's suggesting with the split lots is say if you have a lot that has 150 feet of frontage on Route 6, but it goes 700 feet back. Yes, sir. That today you can only develop commercially the first 500, 500 feet. Yes, and with a split uh, lot special permit, he's suggesting that either the zoning board or the planning board, whoever is going to be the special permit granting authority, has the ability to let you do something in the back that is that is part of the commercial development. But I think that that entity would have the ability to say, no, you can't put parking back there. No, you can't put this there, whatever. You might be able to do something in terms of use this square footage. I was well, you can do that. You can use yeah. it now. Right now, you can use it for your square footage. You can use it for setbacks. You can use it for lot coverage. You can use it for open space, whatever requirement. But if you're doing anything physical, if you want to do a bioretention, a, 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 a a, a drainage uh, re retention basin, you can't do it. Anything physical, you can't use on the residential that services the business. Yeah, but why, why, why fool with that? I say leave it just the way it is. 
Every time you go slapping things around, you get further into the, to the rear here. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with the current laws that are already put in favor. And not only that, but if we go by a case-by-case -case basis, I mean, I'm not saying that anybody in this room would be guilty of it, but palms do get greased. Yes. And, you know, this it might be okay for this guy because he's best friends with a guy on the planning board, but then this guy who doesn't get along with the town, well, yes. you know, we're not going to do it for him. We're not going to allow it for him. We won't we'll see that happen. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, this, th this is politics we're talking about. This, this, <laughs> this is a common problem where some communities have basically zoned strips, and they say it goes back, and it doesn't follow lot lines. And it's, you know, um, and it creates problems. And, you know, you, you might say, oh, it's a, a, a case by case. But actually, it is case by case because when the zoning was done, they did it the easy way. Okay, we're just going to go 500 feet back, and we don't care where the lot lines are. So the other alternative is, well, you can go and, and try to make the zoning fit the lot lines. And then you end up with a kind of a jagged, Zoning, and you might have some lots that go way, way back. Um, you know, it's a, even when you look at but, Home Depot, Home Depot's got a nice big building with a beautiful parking lot in the front. Why would you want to take the building, put it up on top of the street, congest everything up front, take all the traffic, bring it around the side of the building, now there's lighting problems, now oh, people are not seeing off the streets. The building should get set back, parking lot right in the front, where all the lighting is perfect, the street can benefit by it. You can come right in off the street, pull right into the parking lot. So I, it's a, I, it's a, I it's a quite it's a question I'm not of crazy about building the, the building at the edge of the street. It's like someone's house five feet off the edge of the street. It, it, you can hear the traffic all day long, you know. Well, we're talking business type uses. I, I know what you're saying, but you, now you, it kind of gets into volume a little bit. Then you get the building right on top of the street. Then the sidewalks are there. I mean, the building really should be set back, just like Home Depot with the parking lot right in the front. That that is my idea of a decent commercial development right there. And there's another contradiction. There, 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 there would be some that would say the opposite. No, I understand that part. When I go to Home Depot, <laughs> the traffic, up, their parking you wouldn't lot want blind corners for cars to negotiate around with pedestrian tra increased pedestrian traffic. There. You wouldn't want that. Say that again. If you if if you if your goal if your ultimate goal is to increase pedestrian and bicycle traffic along Route Six, mm -hmm. then you would not want cars coming around the side of a blind corner because there's a building right there, not being able to see the increased pedestrian and bicycle traffic right there on the road. We're not talking about putting the buildings right at the street, but we're saying put them back 10, 15, 20 feet back. Don't have parking in the front. Have parking to the side or to the rear. To serve what purpose? To, to avoid driving down a strip and all you see along the st is a parking lot, parking lot, parking lot, parking lot. Yeah, but it does not exactly. uh, But that's in like, home, home people's different areas. Best, uh, the, the study shows that like, what he's talking about is more down, like, no, towards the Four River side, like, you come into the West Park. But where the residents are living over there, trying, they're trying to come up with a village atmosphere. Right. That's what I was concerned about. Right. Right. There's a split lots over there, and, and somebody buying all, buying all the business, put a business like that in front, and the five on each side of the street behind it, stuck with a parking lot right behind them, on what's behind it. But if it's if it's looking that's going to be a split residential, <coughs> I mean, that, that split res not what the commercial is. It's not going to be, uh, you know, some of those commercial buildings we have down next to 88, over where, in the middle section over where most of the residents are. Because even some of the plazas, the plaza that we have down there, the houses will put behind it. You know? Well, why don't we uh, now have an opportunity, uh, we have these display boards that have some of the um, areas and what, what some of the thoughts are of what we'd like to do. Uh, we'd like to hear comments. I know some of you are kind of shy about, some of you are not shy, but some of you are shy. You put two uh, stickers on the board that shows the adult entertainment district, how large it is. It's... It consists of 13 lots in the town and it's five of them. It's shown right here. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's it, right? How many lots is that? It, 
I don't know the, number, the exact number of lots. There's 13 lots, and the town owns five. So you're down to eight. You're going to fool with that? Yeah. That's not right. You should be extending the district to another location as well. That's what should happen to it. Okay, can we have people uh, provide some uh, input on the, on the boards?